the paradigms around management come from the machine age where you were making a car, you were making typewriters, you were making a physical object. And so the work you were doing was repetitive. It didn't actually need your own energy or an interest or excitement. It was actually just repetitive. So a lot of the management practice was actually designed around how do I make a human behave like a robot? Yet now, majority of the way that we actually make even car companies <laughs> make revenue from software. But we haven't upgraded our management theories and our management practices sufficiently fast. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Better Works podcast, People Fundamentals. I'm your host, Alex Lerald, Senior Director of Corporate Marketing. Better Works core belief in People Fundamentals revolves around enabling everyone in the workforce to strive for excellence, to foster creativity, and to acknowledge each individual's contributions. Better Works translates these beliefs into business fundamentals through strategic HR leadership. And in this show, We're diving even deeper into these principles as we hear from the experts about how you can make them come alive in your organization. And in this episode, we're delving into the fascinating world of HR technology with a true luminary, Ian Cook, Vizier's VP of Research and Strategy. Vizier helps organizations drive business impact by driving people impact through data analytics. It's also the engine that powers BetterWorks Advanced Analytics. Imagine a world where AI seamlessly integrates with HR strategy, unlocking new dimensions of efficiency. Today, Ian will shed light on Vizier's approach to the Gen AI era. With AI, technology and data intertwine to create a robust foundation for HR analytics. Vizier's work with V, its conversational assistant, is shaping interaction with data to make analytics more accessible. In the age of Gen AI, data is supreme and Vizier ensures that the bridge between analytics and applications is not only seamless, but also fortified with the highest standards of security. At BetterWorks, one of our recent surveys uncovered a significant trend. More than half of employees are independently embracing Gen AI tools, whether or not their companies allow it. What does this mean for HR and business leaders? Ian elaborates on these insights and shares how this trend reflects human adaptability and creativity, emphasizing the importance of education on AI ethics. Keep in mind the shift from transactional tasks to strategic decision-making in HR. This is exemplified by Ian's perspective on predictive performance reviews and the notion of what he calls people flow. That is, making adjustments to your growth forecasts and other business metrics based on individual performance, just as one would from a financial angle. Ian hails from Scotland and brings a unique flavor, both in his insights and, quite literally, in his mention of a legendary drink that he calls Scotland's best-kept secret. Stay tuned to discover why this fizzy orange elixir holds a special place in Scottish culture. Our conversation was recorded live at HR Tech 2023. Listen in now as we explore Gen AI, Vizier's groundbreaking strategies, and the exciting future ahead for HR technology. I am so, so happy to uh, have my next guest here. Ian Cook is the VP of Research and Strategy at Vizier, one of our partners. Ian, tell me about your role at Vizier. Great to be here, Alex. My role at Vizier is two things, fundamentally. Really, really smart technologists who built an incredible analytics platform that, that drives the kind of work we're doing with you. And then deep domain expertise. And like, how does data shape HR strategy? How do you deploy that to managers and business leaders so they make better decisions and actually make the business perform better? I'm the second half of that business. I've become deeply learned in the technology over time, but when I joined Vizier 10 years ago, it was to bring that rich understanding of how does the people side of business operate so that as we built out the capabilities, as we actually shaped the way the product worked, we weren't doing it in a box. We were actually thinking about who's going to use us, who's the consumer, how do we actually solve the problem, not just make some stuff. So my background to get there, serial entrepreneur in a couple of data businesses prior to Vizier, and then uh, 10 years consulting in people's strategy globally, so with large corporations before that. Originally started in Scotland, now live in Canada. Yeah, it's been a fantastic career journey. I bet. But but (laughs) non-linear, so. No, it sounds like it absolutely has not been linear, and it sounds like it has been anything but boring, especially now. And I will just say that this is the year of generative AI. Everybody's talking about it. So tell me about what Vizier's doing with Gen AI. 
Yeah, so we, we understood the opportunity of Gen AI fairly fast. Like we're, we're data people. Like the, one of the pieces that isn't talked about AI is AI is as much a data problem as it is an AI problem. Like if you haven't got your data sorted right, if you don't understand risks, privacy, ethics, in data, then all your dreams about AI may crash because you will either break a regulation or you'll do something that you don't want your business to do. So as data experts, we understood that really fast. We built our technology stack to have a common data architecture where we have what's called metadata, so data about data that allows us to do things that others can't because you can't just dump your um, employee data into a, an LLM and have it tell you what's wrong, that doesn't work. And so we were excited about it because one of the kind of classic impediments to analytics in general is the consumption problem where people don't necessarily want to look at a chart. They don't necessarily have a mental model of what's my data trying to tell me. And so asking people to interrogate a dashboard and find their way to their answer, it was the paradigm. Again, we instantly recognized how these kinds of tools can just help shrink that gap to use. So we built V. V is a conversational assistant that allows you to literally talk to your data. Things like, what's my headcount? How did it change? Did anybody's significant move in the last month? Any pay changes I should be aware of? Those simple text questions can be asked of the application. It will securely return you an answer. It's one of the other key pieces about AI, like the security. You know, an LLM doesn't come with security. If, if you've got data you need to secure, which most people data you do, then you need to have a security system in place before you play with your LLM. So in the same way as you can have the conversation with V, if I ask it, what's the CEO's salary? <laughs> that, that data may be in my stack, but it's not gonna tell me. And that's, again, every listening will understand the fundamental importance of that. It's like what people suggest can happen sounds wonderful, but you got to have security in place. you got to make sure your application won't hallucinate. Absolutely. We, we call that a better works responsible AI. Which Great <laughs> word. We're fully, fully on board with you there. Yes. And it's so essential. You know, we just did some research and I'm curious about your take on this. We found a pretty significant number said that they're already using Gen AI tools outside of what their employer has provided them. Interesting. Yeah, so they're figuring out these efficiency hacks with these tools. What do you think that means for HR leaders and business leaders? It's one of the things that has pulled me into working in the human space and business in the first place is humans are so creative and adaptable that often we just need to get out of the way. Mm -hmm. There's all this like, how are we gonna make lots of Gen AI engineers like, you know what, I think they're going to make themselves. If, if our business is anything to go by, every single one of our developers has basically built the knowledge base, explored, like downloaded stuff, made their own things at home because they're just fascinated by it. We've given space permission and encouragement, often important things, but like well, there is no kind of paternalistic, thou shalt become an AI developer because <laughs> they just know that's their future and they're pulling themselves there fast anyway. So I think that's you know one of the messages like, you know what, we don't have to control for everything. Often to move fast, you actually have to remove controls. But the, the second piece would be then a massive need for education because We've all seen, I, hopefully, I hope we've all seen the stories of if you are dropping company secrets into OpenAI, that is no longer a company secret. Yeah. That now could get returned as data to your competitor. Yeah. And so I think there's a, an education level that people need to understand is like, company policy on company data does not change because of generative AI. Like you as a person in our company need to understand how that what you're using will interface with something like a Gen AI and whether or not this is safe use of that opportunity. Because I use it, if I, if I have to put together a short spiel for a presentation, I will get started with OpenAI, I'll just use the free version, you know, give me 200 words on X, and then I'll, I'll adjust. But it, it, it doesn't, it, it gives me like a 40% lift because I'm not having to start from scratch. It doesn't have to like, get that initial spark. So all of those hacks make sense to me. And I'm not surprised people have adopted them. Like people will, will find the shortest path to success themselves yeah. if you let them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so I, I love it. I think it's a great story. I, I think the key parts for from an HR perspective are like, we need to educate you on safe and appropriate use, understanding company data and what these things are doing. Because it isn't entirely benign. Exactly. Right, copyright issues, security issues, who owns the data issues. Like there's a bunch of stuff that hasn't been said that as an employee, you should be well versed in before you go just randomly doing stuff. Absolutely. 
And the reality is some may not be, right? I suspect some aren't. We've come across some interesting stories out in the world where I won't name the organization, but we were talking about our capabilities and analytics and various things. And the CIO of this company said, oh, no, I'll just get a version of GPT-4 and I'll throw all our company data in and it will tell us what we need to know. And that's a, that's a CTO, like an, you know, a C-level executive and looking at people data purely as bytes and bits, not as the privacy and the ethics and the fact that this some of this belongs to the human, not to the company. I would have anticipated a higher level of education in that population. Our experience is that's not, it's not necessarily catching up. And that's very much about people data is distinctive. You cannot just assume people data operates like all your other data, it doesn't. And again, that's where that sort of communication, education, messaging, as a, I'm a CHRO, but actually about four months ago, I put out a piece, like the CHRO should be connected to everybody else when the Gen AI strategy, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why, because uh, the impacts on people are substantial, and if they're not engaged, you know, we can kind of get that rogue CTO doing exactly. the wrong thing. Exactly, exactly, yeah. You know, it's interesting too, that same survey that we ran had some data around people's fears and anxieties around it. There's a little bit of that, not as much as I expected, but what do you think the biggest benefit of Gen AI is for your average employee? I think the biggest benefit for your average employee is just is a productivity lift and, and a productivity lift on some of the boring stuff. Right. Like the, you know, generation, creation, curation. I'll give you a simple example. Like, you know, Zoom has integrated a summarizer right. in its back end. There's issues with that because that is legally discoverable data. So you need to be aware of the conversation you're having because if you have a conversation and it's recorded, even if Zoom gets it wrong, that will be seen as the truth. Oh boy. Yeah. But, so yeah. my habit with that is I basically run, yeah. when I need to run the summary, I run it and then I flag it as a not an accurate representation. I'm gaming Zoom system, but what I get is a summary. So I don't have to take notes. I don't have to go back to the note. If I've got a meeting that I want to track, it's automated for me. It's a time saver. I love it. So that I see as, like, I see those, you know, lots of opportunities, lots of spaces for those kinds of things. And again, I think that's when people have those experiences, like, you know what, this is just going to save me doing not necessarily boring work, but kind of not necessarily value add either. So, so I think it, it augments an individual and many of the good opportunities are how it can augment an individual. So I see that as a positive thing. Yeah, makes total sense. And I agree. I mean, I've been using, I'm in content marketing and it's a lot of blank page anxiety, right? Sometimes getting started is the hardest part. In many technical spaces, it's actually reducing the barrier to access for non-technical people. Um, somebody else was sharing. So there's this language called SQL. It's, it's basically like you know, Excel formulas on steroids. Yeah. <laughs> and so that creates a barrier to access to data. It's like, oh, I know SQL. I can get the data you need. It's like, well, now you have a Gen AI. You can actually ask the Gen AI what you want. It will generate the SQL statement for you, you can then inject that into the data. So there's other opportunities where some of that specialty, like I know stuff that you don't know, actually goes away because you, you train the bot to do that work. So I, I can see being able to operate a lot more fluidly on those kinds of intelligence tasks uh, with fewer barriers where you need to work through a specialist individual with specialist knowledge. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great point. So. Moving on from AI, I could talk about it all day because I'm fascinated because I also, you know, just had this childhood obsession with the Terminator. <laughs> and I grew up in Florida, really oh. close to the theme parks. And I'll never forget the Terminator. Mine was lawnmower man, so never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember this, like, it wasn't a ride. It was like a show. But there was the Skynet takeover in the beginning. Like, you're herded into this room. And I was just, like, so freaked out as a kid. It was so exhilarating and fun. And then they had the... But Oftentimes, I think about that in the uh, modern era. Yeah, so I mean, there's there's, a, there's actually a really good podcast on that. Um, Skynet presumes sentience because it's prefaced on the fact that the AI is trying to protect itself. AI has no actual sense of its own identity. It isn't sentient. We make the mistake of thinking it behaves. It behaves like a human, so we gift it sentience. Ah, uh, yes. But it isn't. It has no awareness of itself. It is simply math. Yes, you're right. I feel better now. But uh, moving on from AI, what else? 
are you seeing here that excites you? Have you seen anything cool, innovative, anything that made you go, wow, that's original, that's unique? The stuff that I find inspiring, exciting is is the stuff like BetterWorks, which is really helping an employee understand how to build their performance. Like I've studied engagement for a really long time and the notion that you know the company has to engage the employee I think is the wrong way around. I think companies create circumstances that enable a, a, an employee to engage themselves. And so again, technologies like BetterWorks, like some of the other capabilities where an employee can express an intent, can express the desire, can look to, to learn, grow, to be their best, and they're supported in their time with their needs, with some degree of like awareness of who they are, just I think that's the right way to unleash human performance. I agree. I mean, we love to start with the premise that everybody wants to do their best work. They come to work wanting to achieve. You don't need to make them achieve. You just need to create those conditions that allow them to do that work well and recognize them, make them feel appreciated. Very simple, basic human stuff, right? But we kind of lose sight of that in the workplace, right? It's like we walk in and we kind of dehumanize the experience a little bit sometimes. Absolutely. And, and a lot of the old paradigms, again, like the, the paradigms around management come from the machine age where you were making a car, you were making typewriters, you were making a physical object. And so the work you were doing was repetitive. It didn't actually need your own energy or an interest or excitement. It was actually just repetitive. So a lot of the management practice was actually designed around how do I make a human behave like a robot? Yet now, majority of the way that we actually make even car companies <laughs> make revenue from software. Car companies differentiate themselves on service and design and excitement because the robots are actually making the cars. But we haven't upgraded our management theories and our management practices sufficiently fast. A lot of people still struggle under that machine rigmarole of like, I've got to make you work hard. It's like, no, you don't have to make me work hard. You have to make it worth my while to work hard. Yes, I want to work and hard. And want to work hard. Because I chose to be here, right. <laughs> and give excitement because yeah, I am 100% with you. Some people really don't want to work. But, but trying to make them work is just like, why, why waste your energy on the 10%? Exactly. The 90% are just trying to understand how they thrive. Exactly. And anything you can do to, to help lift, encourage, guide, support, you know, redirect those folks is time and energy well spent. Absolutely. And to your point about outdated processes, the performance review process, I was fascinated when I learned that the army invented it. The American army invented it over 100 years ago. And what a strange legacy to carry forth into our modern business practices, something that was very specific to a, you know, a certain population, a certain way of working, you know. Yeah. I suspect you'll find the army has dropped that particular <laughs> Pro practice. Probably. Probably like 60 years ago. <laughs> the army's like, what are you guys still doing that? Like, what? No, because I, I asked a question today in, in my sessions, like, you know, how many people in the room would trust the performance ratings in your business? Nobody put their hand up. So like, again, a, a real signal of a, a broken process that we keep repeating because we kind of feel like we have to. And there is a better way. Throwing away ratings is not the better way, but like actually digging into true delivered performance. Like what are you actually producing, providing, making happen? Exactly. At a team and an individual level. I mean, we have the data for that these days. Exactly. It's not so hard anymore. We do have the data and actually that brings me full circle to BetterWorks, this new AI capabilities, but one of the things that it does allow, you know, managers to do is use data to inform a performance review, it's trying to remove a lot of those biases, like the recency bias, you know, maybe I had an incredible first quarter, but the last quarter, my kid's not sleeping anymore, going through a sleep regression, somebody on my team left, like a little bit, and that often is what people bring up when they're sitting down to write those reviews. And we can help eliminate some of that. Which is huge, because again, put yourself in the seat of the manager. They are busy. They got somebody breathing down their neck to get them completed. They're like, what do I remember? I've got five minutes to put this together. Like they're doing their best, but they, they are overloaded with so many other demands. Again, I, I don't know exactly the data, but there is a fairly large amount of evidence that managers are completely overloaded right now. 
And so supporting their work with evidence, shrinking their decision space, speeding their effectiveness. I think all of those are what HR should be focusing on. Absolutely. And that's why, again, I'm excited by those systems. Like, you know, forget the announcements from the big HIS. It's like, you know, it really is literally whatever. It's like yeah. the transactional world is done. Right. That's not helping me drive performance in my company. Exactly. And it always amazes me how something as essential to your existence as a business as your literal performance often becomes an afterthought or like just a box to check. Like we did the reviews, great. Now we can rate and comp and, and move people around. But at the end of the day, it's just such a, I don't know, it's just such an opportunity for people to really affect business outcomes. 100%. I don't think they see that sometimes. I see organizations moving towards that. I've seen some good examples of people striving for that, but it is, it's one of the ways I think we all know we've been successful is when people aren't counting how many performance reviews have been completed and they're actually saying like the performance review process indicates that our future revenues are predictable or our future revenues are going to go up or future revenues may go down or we've got risks in certain areas. It's not, oh, look, yes, we've got compliance on time. I do genuinely think that's becoming irrelevant. Yeah. <laughs> Much as it might annoy some folks, but <laughs> it's the, what are we doing with that data that tells the business about where performance is going? Yes because there is a huge opportunity there. And again, that elevates the CHRO like, to the same level as the CFO. The CFO looks at spend, growth and revenue and makes adjustments on growth because of how that cash is flowing. The CHRO should be doing the same things based on how people and their capability is flowing, like this notion of people flow. So I see that world. I'm glad we're working towards it. Yes. Can't come fast enough for me, but that's, you know, that's, that's why I do what I do. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, sometimes it really is about going back to the basics. You know, what are you trying to do? Are you doing it? And if you're not doing it, why? And what can we do to intervene or support, you know? And we tend to, I don't know, overcomplicate things sometimes. <laughs> I think that's a great perception, Alex, because often people say, like, well, we're so busy. Are you busy doing the right things? Often the excuse for change is like, well, we're just so busy. But then you're telling me it's not working. It's like, but I'm so busy. But so are you busy doing the right things? And, exactly. and sometimes stopping is actually the right answer. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But uh, let me ask you some like fun questions that we can get to know you in. You're from Scotland. Yep. Tell me about Iron Brew. Oh, so Iron Brew is Scotland's best kept secret. It is a fizzy orange drink with a high iron percentage that is <laughs> renowned across Scotland as a hangover cure. <laughs> it sounds awesome. It, it is pretty awesome. It tastes pretty great. And then the, the, the best thing when I was kind of growing up, it, it had a whole ad campaign called Made in Scotland from Girders. <laughs> Girders being big pieces of steel and, and associated video footage with that, which is just, it's hilarious. It, it is a, yeah, it's a fun part. Quite often if I go home, I'll either have an iron brew or I'll bring a couple of bottles back to share with the family. I love that. Uh, what are your hobbies? What do you do for fun? Uh, I ride a bike a lot, nice. so it's been kind of part of just staying healthy, keeping my brain focused. I, I live in a nice part of Vancouver, so I get to ride in the forest, which is good. Oh, you're in Vancouver. I'm, I'm in, in the Vancouver. Pacific Northwest. I live in cool. Portland. Okay. So. Cool. Yeah. And then my other hobby is a hockey dad. One of my sons plays uh, competitive hockey, so I spend a lot yeah, of time that's awesome. uh, getting him places, uh, helping him perform. Very cool. Uh, your take on remote work, here to stay, is yeah. hybrid the way? Hybrid is the way. Uh, certain roles can be done remote. Uh, I think you have to work harder at that and you need a certain character. So remote, small percentage, probably not the baseline, but hybrid baseline. I'm the um, individual called Nick Bloom. I follow him, I guess the, the research, the thought, the kind of ex the way he's explained and, and engaged in that whole debate is fantastic. There is so much benefit from hybrid yeah. and it gives you the chance to do the right work in the right place. Yes. And we've all had the experience of you know, fully from home, fully from the office. We, again, in, individuals invariably know how they work best. Right. Forcing them back to a suboptimal workspace just because you want to look at them is so <laughs> arcane. Like it's just it really so is. arcane. It is. At the same time, bringing people together to do we, there's things we've done to collectively together around a whiteboard that we just couldn't do virtually. We couldn't do remote. Like we tried to do them remotely, and they just didn't have the same juice. So understanding what those are, setting up the spaces to make that work, getting the ways to bring that together, and then just the again the casual stuff in the office. 
the, the, the water cooler stuff counts. It does, absolutely. I, I know the people who built V, and so I can, you know, after, after a show like this, I'll often go back and say, hey, I was talking to these people about V, they love this, they were questions about this, and so that, it just closes that cycle where the person who's making it isn't always the person who's presenting it. Right. And so they, they get that, to, they get to feel how their work is touching the real world, which is, again, hugely important. So, absolutely. So I'm fully bought into hybrid. I think most organizations, unless they have a reason not to, will stabilize out to some form of hybrid. Yeah. And I wouldn't focus on a certain number of days. It's like, what's right for our different work units? I'm so against this notion of single HR policy. Yes. It, maybe it was the world when we were making cars. It is no longer the world when we have got such a diversity of people and spaces and talent inside a business. So it is fair to have different approaches for different populations. Exactly, equity, it's equity, right? It's equity, exactly. I think that's brilliant. Amazing. You're so fun to talk to. Thanks for coming by. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Ian highlighted the importance of understanding that AI is as much a data problem as it is an AI problem. The people at Vizier recognized this early on and developed a technology stack with a common data architecture, emphasizing the significance of metadata and handling data effectively. Our conversation with Ian provided valuable insights into the evolving landscape of HR technology and the role of Gen AI in shaping the future of work. Let's discuss three key takeaways and some practical information for your organization. First, embrace Gen AI with caution. Organizations should ensure their data is sorted correctly, considering factors like risks, privacy, and ethics. Implementing security measures is crucial, and employees need education on the safe and appropriate use of generative AI tools. Second, empower employees with productivity tools. Gen AI can significantly benefit employees by automating everyday tasks, assisting with strategic ones, and boosting productivity across the board. Tools like conversational assistants allow individuals to interact with data effortlessly, saving time and improving decision-making. Organizations should invest in technologies that enhance individual productivity, focusing on removing barriers and fostering creativity. Lastly, rethink performance management. Ian advocates for a shift in performance management practices. Instead of focusing on traditional methods like performance ratings, organizations should leverage data to inform meaningful performance reviews. The goal is to create a process that not only ensures compliance, but also helps predict future business performance, elevating the role of HR to that of a truly strategic business partner. As businesses implement these changes to adapt to the evolution of work, these takeaways underscore the importance of data-driven HR strategies. They also address the need for continuous education on AI usage and the potential of innovative tools to enhance employee performance and engagement in the coming years. Be sure to stay tuned for our next episode of the People Fundamentals podcast. We're hearing from June Bauer, leadership expert and founder of TalkShop. She'll explain the feedback formula that empowers managers to inspire their teams drive performance, and foster a culture of continuous growth. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google to find out what's in store. And if you like what you hear, share us with your friends and colleagues. We'll see you again soon.